Hello, and thank you for tuning in. In my introductory transesophageal echocardiography video, I discuss the probe and the order of how I acquire an exam. In this video, I will go through the exam and return to specific views to interpret findings. These are the sources I frequently use, and I do not have any relationships to disclose. The buttons on the Philips and Siemens machines are aesthetically different, but functionally very similar. The main ones include 2D grade scale imaging, continuous wave Doppler, pulse wave Doppler, color Doppler, the trackball, and measurement tool. We also use biplane, M-mode, and 3D, which are found on the touchscreen of the Phyllis machine. Along the way, it is critical to have capture of the EKG and understand that some measurements are made at particular points of the cardiac cycle. I start with the five chamber view and biplane through the left atrium, mitral valve, and left ventricle to simultaneously obtain a two chamber view. If I am using a Phillips machine, I also capture a full volume 3D clip. I then get an impression of the right atrium, tricuspid valve, and right ventricle. I shift my focus back to the left side to assess its structures at different omniplane angles, and I note that between 60 and 90 degrees, the left atrial appendage and left upper pulmonary vein can come into view. I optimize an aortic valve long axis view and capture a 3D clip. And from here, shift my focus to the aortic root and arch. I obtain a right ventricular inflow and outflow view and assess the tricuspid and pulmonic valves, and later the interatrial septum. I omniplane to zero and advance the probe for the transgastric and deep transgastric views. I run the aorta and finish with a view of the great vessels. Going back to these views, I calculate the left ventricle's ejection fraction by the Simpsons method from the biplane video clip in end diastole and end systole, and do the same in 3D. In the mid-esophageal four-chamber view, I M mode through the left atrium, mitral valve, and left ventricle and assess the severity of mitral regurgitation or lack thereof. I go on to employ the pulse wave Doppler's range resolution capability and assess the left atrial appendage. I flip to the mid-esophageal long axis view and pulse wave Doppler at the mitral valve leaflet tips to capture the peak E and A wave velocities. It generates the E to A ratio for diastology, and I can measure the deceleration time and pressure half time of the E wave to estimate the mitral valve area. In the same region, I obtain a transmitral gradient using continuous wave Doppler and tracing the inflow that is below the baseline. This assists in grading degrees of mitral stenosis or lack thereof. If there is significant mitral regurgitation, the continuous wave density above the baseline is a quick qualitative way to gauge severity of mitral regurgitation. I go on to manipulate my 3D clip of the mitral valve, note its anatomy and leaflet integrity, its relationship to the left atrial appendage, aortic valve, and interatrial septum. I then measure the left ventricular outflow tract and aortic annular diameters in mid-systole, and the aortic sinus, sinotubular junction, and aortic root diameters in diastole. In the short axis, I can obtain an aortic valve area by polymetry in mid-systole. And from here, I look to the right ventricle's inflow and outflow view. If there is significant regurgitation through the tricuspid valve, I calculate the right ventricle systolic pressure and further its myocardial performance index. Back in the mid-esophageal four-chamber view, I calculate the right ventricle's fractional area change and assess strain. I measure the tricuspid annular diameter and free wall thickness. I assess the left ventricle's propagation velocity with M mode and the mitral valve's lateral and medial annular velocities with pulse wave tissue Doppler to supplement my overall assessment of diastolic function. En route to the transgastric views, I measure the coronary sinus and capture the mitral valve in cross section to measure its area by polymetry and I compare it to the ones I generated by pressure half time and deceleration time. Advancing further, I measure the left ventricle's wall thickness at end diastole and I calculate the fractional area change. In the deep transgastric views, I obtain the left ventricle stroke volume and transaortic valvular gradient, which will generate the aortic valve area by the continuity equation. I grade atheromatous plaques along the aorta and at the great vessels view, measure the ascending aorta diameter in systole. I then look to the main pulmonary artery with pulse wave Doppler. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope this video was educational. Please like and share it where you find it appropriate. 
and leave a comment to get the conversation going. In the videos that follow, I will go over echo reports, pulmonary vein and hepatic vein pulse wave profiles, and valvulopathies like mitral and aortic regurgitation. Stay tuned.